for one thing, Breakfast at Tiffany's is really an iconic film. How do I look? It was an iconic role for Audrey Hepburn. You know, women want to dress like her. They want to wear the same dress. They want to wear the same hat. Uh, Moon River came out of that. It was a big, big hit. The, the, the soundtrack was number one for three months. And so it really invaded the pop consciousness. And so when you say Breakfast at Tiffany's, they go, oh, yeah, it was a great film. But what they forget is that element that wasn't great, which was the yellow face character I'm of Mr. Yunioshi, played by you Mickey Rooney. Mr. Kouraitri, I protest! Oh, darling, I am sorry, but I lost my key. But that was two weeks ago. You cannot go on or keep ringing my bell. You disturb me. You must have a key made. It just made me cringe. I was young, so I couldn't really articulate it. I didn't know how to articulate it, really, but all I know is that I felt something very was very wrong. I got to get to my rest. I'm an artist. I got to call a fight squad on you. Don't be angry, you dear little man. I won't do it again. You promise not to be angry. I might let you take those pictures we mentioned. Wait. Sometime. Anytime. On the other hand, I am able to see the film in its historical context and understand that it was intended to be a comical role, understand that in many ways it is simply a reflection of a stereotype that people had at that time and which I think we've uh, made strides to get away from since then. In looking at the Mr. Yunioshi character, they made up Mickey Rooney to look exactly like cartoon caricatures of Japanese during World War II. If it was a white character, it was a non-ethnic character, I think it could have worked for the purpose that uh, I think Mickey Rooney was there for on a very basic level, which was to provide uh, physical, physical comedy. <laughs> He had great physical comedy, but then perhaps maybe they should have just picked someone who had great physical comedy and not even had a Japanese character. There's an old expression you've probably heard um, in Japan that says the nail that, that sticks up gets pounded down. And so, which is exactly the opposite of the Western proverb of the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Um, and so there's, there's been a tradition of not protesting whenever there, there are negative stereotypes that occurred. And um, so there wasn't a lot of protest at the time. Um, people probably silently endured it. Um, I think that, you know, it was commonplace back then. They got a lot of these big stars to put on this makeup and it doesn't make sense to me that they would because once you see these big stars with this really bad makeup, uh, it just takes you out of the film. I, I think as a movie goer, you look and you go, oh my God, that's, that's Marlon Brando with his eyes slanted and pulled. I mean, that's just kind of, so to, to me it defeated the purpose. You want to get a big star to get attention, but then you know what the big star looks like and he looks kind of this orientalish kind of thing and it doesn't quite look right. Yellow faces where someone else, usually of Caucasian descent, puts on prosthetic types of devices on their face and, and also makeup to make them look Asian. It looks, it looks terrible when you have a white person putting on makeup to look Asian. It just looks garish, it really stands out, it doesn't look very natural. And whenever I see someone like that, I, I think, well, why don't they just get an Asian actor? I think in the old days, um, one of the reasons why directors got white actors to play Asian characters is because uh, they didn't have as many Asian American actors around or they're looking for the big name and you know un unless you give Asian American actors meaty roles other than just playing some one-dimensional villain well you won't develop any stars. I think when you look at the history of film it's probably easier to name or recognize famous Asian bad guys than it is to recognize or name famous uh, Asian good guy characters. Probably one of the more uh, Famous examples, at least for science fiction fans, is Ming the Merciless in Flash Gordon. You have this somewhat menacing um, Asian character who's got the uh, Fu Manchu style beard and he's evil and, and, and powerful and wants to take over the world. I understand that uh, 
if you have a great hero, you need a great villain. You need someone to, for the hero to go up against. And I suppose it makes it, it, it ratchets it up a notch if you have someone who's not just evil, but someone who's really mysterious. So that's probably why they used a lot of Asian villains in, in the past. And so the problem is that uh, what people get from watching these films is that white is good, Asian is bad even if it's a foreign character, because Hollywood doesn't always distinguish between Asians from Asia and Asian Americans. And so when they play a foreign person, it doesn't matter if it's born in Japan or China or Korea, or someone who was raised in America, because they usually have a speaker with an accent anyway. So people don't see the difference between Asian Americans and Asian nationals. He made a grave mistake tonight when he murdered a countryman of mine, and he will regret it. Was this man deliberately posing as you? He was my colleague, keeping Mr. Norvell under observation. Incidentally, he diverted suspicion from myself. Most of our actors don't speak with accents, but they're usually asked to put on a fake Asian accent to play a role. And so that keeps the notion of Asians as foreigners going all the time. And I think it's a sad commentary about how much the media can affect uh, us without even knowing it. Earlier in my days when I was acting, and this is something that is, is so embarrassing, and I, I look at it and I can't even believe I did it, but it, I think it was because of my, my uh, brain, my conditioning as being an actress, and what Hollywood wanted was the exotic uh, character who had an accent. And I caught myself actually in this one interview going in when they didn't even require an accent, doing an accent. He catch you, he beat you. Poof! He's crazy mad about me. He said to me, Susie, I'm crazy mad about you. You do anything you want for goodness sake. Sorry, that was a, a definitive moment in my career. I says, I'm never going to do that again. I was so utterly um, embarrassed and upset at myself that I would do such a thing. Um, but that was another time. The world of Susie Wong is a, a confusing one for a lot of Asian Americans because on one hand, it gave birth to this stereotype of Asian women as prostitutes. And so for that, I think a lot of people hate the film. But when you watch it, it's, it's a pretty balanced movie. You know, I, I, it's, it's hard to blame it for what came afterwards because people did the shorthand version of, oh, Asian woman, prostitute. And it became too superficial, where you don't really understand the woman and where she's coming from. You sailor? A sailor? Why? My father say sailors catch too many girls. You talk to sailor, I beat you. Well, if that's what's bothering you, no, I'm not a sailor. With this movie, The World of Susie Wong, we understand where she comes from. It's a very, it's a deeper portrayal than most. And so I thought it was a very sensitive film, actually. Yes, we're two of a kind. We know she isn't really a human being, so she couldn't possibly have any feelings. Since she's Chinese, it wouldn't matter anyhow. <laughs> One reason why racial stereotypes pop up in film is because people don't necessarily know any better. They're not necessarily aware that what they're doing or what they're portraying or what they've written is a stereotype. And if, if they knew or realized that it could have a, a hurtful impact on people, they might well choose to do something else um, with, with a given scene. Throughout the 19th and 20th century, when you look at our relationship with, for example, China, um, you can see there are periods of time when we're very friendly with China. We tend, or the media, tended to portray them as um, either exotic but interesting or Exotic, but really at the end of the day, people just like us. And then there are periods of time when uh, the U.S. had very strict anti-immigration laws or had um, wartime propaganda. In the days where there was yellow peril, the notion of yellow peril, where um, Western societies needed to watch out for Asian societies, Eastern societies, um, they began having to justify why, th why it is that they wanted to watch out for, um, for those societies. And so they began making up certain um, aspects about them, like you can't trust them, for example. That would be one type of stereotype. Most people don't know 
um, that originally the United States recruited people from Asia in the um, mid 1800s in order to work on the railroads and in some of the, the most dangerous parts of the railroads. After uh, the country was connected coast to coast, they decided to try to get rid of Asians. In 1870, the United States Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act that um, made it illegal for Chinese to immigrate to the United States at all. For the longest time, the Chinese were the threat, the yellow peril. And then, then the Japanese became the threat. And so it became easy in 1942 to put you know, 120,000 Japanese Americans in internment camps. They said, if you got 1 16th blood that's Japanese, we don't trust you. We're going to throw you in camp. There were about 15 internment camps throughout the United States to house 120,000 Japanese Americans. A lot of these camps were um, made out of converted horse stalls because they had to make these things at the last minute. So they're very much in very crunched um, conditions and very extreme weather. It was either very hot or very cold. When the war broke out, of course, my parents were very young and they had to go to camps, unjustly so. A lot of them, as you know, probably know, were taken without a moment. The minute Pearl Harbor happened, a lot of people just disappeared. No, there was no inkling where they went, how long they would be gone, if they would be coming back. So you can imagine the fear. They were given two weeks to pack everything and to leave. My father at the time was 25 years old and he was fairly successful. He had two drugstores, he was a pharmacist. It really devastated my father in many ways that he would never even talk about. I'm really sorry about that. He was never able to con really confront these demons and what happened during the war. A lot of the uh, Nisei never recovered from it. I would say the majority, if not all. Uh, it is one defining moment in their lives where it was this one event that bonded them all together. In fact, they still define themselves by what barrack were you in, what camp were you in, because it was one moment, the one moment in time that they all experienced the same thing. In the 1980s, there was this movement to get an apology from the government. And in 1981, it led to the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. And it was made up of congressional people. And it became a redress bill in the late 80s. And eventually, what they asked for was an apology. I was one of the 15 leaders who went in there to talk to Congress and trying to get them to pass this bill. And we got it passed. You know, September 17, 1987, got passed. And a wonder of wonder, Ronald Reagan actually signed the bill in 1988. I think uh, the industry began to get away from yellow face by, say, the late 60s. I think maybe the civil rights movement helped maybe to make people more sensitive about how they're portraying people. But when you get to see Asian American characters whose first language is English, and their ethnicity is not the main reason why we're interested in them. That's refreshing. In range? Not yet, sir. Come on, come on. She'll fly apart. Fly apart, then. And it's also been important that, uh, you know, we had Joyce Takei in Star Trek. Shield! I mean, when he was doing Star Trek, that was a huge, major breakthrough for Asian Americans because he was part of, you know, he was part of the crew and he was an Asian American. He didn't have an accent. Captain's log, USS Excelsior, Hikaru Sulu commanding. After three years, I've concluded my first assignment as master of this vessel. We're heading home under full... I've heard stories from people living in Chicago, Washington State, California, when George Takei came on the, the screen as Mr. Sulu, everyone ran into the living room to see him, including their grandma, and because they, they were just amazed that they saw someone who looked like them who wasn't an embarrassment to them. You know, they can say, yes, yes, you know. And people have this need to see themselves reflected as being part of society, as being a positive part of society. And so George Takei was really important in the Star Trek television series and then in the movies beginning in 1980. And 1991, uh, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, is one of probably, probably the best action film that any Asian American ever played in, because he got to be captain of his own ship. So instead of saying, I, Captain, Warp Factor 6, or whatever, you know, he got to actually save Captain Kirk's butt. Target that explosion and fire. Cartwright, just a minute. Nice to see you in action. One more time, Captain Kirk. Take care. 
So we need that stuff. We need to see ourselves as heroes. We need to see ourselves kicking butt. You know, it just, it just does well for our self-esteem. And so thank God for George Takei and Star Trek. I must say, okay, the good thing is, there's no good thing about stereotypes, but I must say, the positive thing that comes out of it is, thank God we are, have evolved since then. And Hollywood has evolved and we've come a long way since we've seen Mickey Rooney portray that character. The point is to look at the film, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and to learn what we can about why it was cast that way, how audiences perceived it at the time, how audiences perceive it now. And from that discussion or from that analysis, increase our understanding of why stereotypes can be harmful and um, how we can respond to them and um, even perhaps use incidents or uh, movie scenes like those in Breakfast at Tiffany as a learning opportunity, as a positive to understand how things have changed since then or haven't changed since then. Miss Coley, this time I'm not only calling the police, but the fire department and the New York State Housing Commission, and if necessary, the Board of Health. Quiet up there. You want to wake the whole house? We can't pretend that it was never part of the film. We can't pretend that it wasn't a product of its time and that it is an image that probably offended people back then and many of us still find offensive now. But it is useful because it's a part of filmmaking history. It's also part of an iconic film. The fact that Paramount is willing to put this on their DVD as a supplement, or as a supplement is, yes, absolutely. It is an open-mindedness to show a different perspective historically, as well as how things are today and how, how we as Asian Americans feel today. Uh, absolutely, it is an education, and I applaud them for that, absolutely. Mm -hmm.